The first speaker this afternoon, I am sure that you will recognize the voice wherever you are or work in the province. She uh, has more phone calls or receives more phone calls or emails in the office than the rest of the staff combined. She is well respected for her knowledge of practice and is always there to support you and guide you in making the correct decisions for your own clinical practice. Her name is Susan Paul. Uh, she's been the college practice advisor since July 2002, so she's got longevity more than everybody else. Uh, in addition to being the practice advisor for the college, Susan keeps up her clinical work by working in Fraser Health. Uh, she's also a clinical assistant professor at the University of British Columbia and assists with teaching in the first year uh, professional issues course. And her most recent um, appointment is as the director for the clinical faculty affairs at the University of British Columbia, which is a feather in the cap of physical therapists that we have, a physical therapist in that position. So it's, um, Susan's presentation today is called The Physical Therapist Intention Versus the Patient's Reaction, which is certainly uh, calls that we get a lot in the office of what I did and what the other, what the client interpreted as, which is not really what I was intending. So Susan is gonna talk to us about that topic. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you the face of Susan Paul. I'm sure you've heard her voice. Thank you. It's a bit alarming to see that photo. I'll be glad to get the next. <laughs> Look at that one. Okay. Okay. So thank you everybody for sticking around for the afternoon presentation. Um, I guess the first question to ask is, you know, why, why this topic? Why are we talking about touch? Well, as the practice advisor, I get an awful lot of calls from the public, um, sometimes concerned about an interaction with a patient or a physiotherapist uh, where they maybe misunderstood the role of touch or why they were um, asked to take you know, their shirt off during an assessment and so on. And so I'm often fielding those calls from the public. And um, you can imagine that if you're the physiotherapist on the other end of that, on rare, more rare occasions, we will get a complaint that centers around that where somebody either thinks it was inappropriate touching or you know, in some cases thinks it was um, sexual misconduct the way that they were touched. So today I just wanna take a few minutes to really, I hope, raise some awareness and help put us back in the position um, to appreciate how the patient might be experiencing the interaction. So often when people call, when the public calls and they tell me what's happened, what they describe sounds like normal physical therapy practice, normal handling, just what you would expect to happen. And so I have to kind of explain to them that that's typical, that would be expected, here's why that would happen. Um, but you can imagine that if somebody does think something inappropriate has happened, that allegation is extraordinarily stressful for the, for the physical therapist to be dealing with. So what I'm hoping is um, that we can have a conversation about, um, you know, are there some simple strategies, things that we could do that would improve our patient's experience? Because if the patient is experiencing it as inappropriate touch or what have you, uh, not great for the therapeutic relationship. So what could we do um, that might change the way that they are perceiving that interaction? The first thing uh, you know, we think about is public awareness or lack thereof. You know, I had a, a, pay, a member of the public call, and some of you probably heard this story, but she said, um, I went to see the physiotherapist to get my shoulder treated, and she made me take my shirt off. Uh, is that normal practice? And I, so I explained, yes, you know, um, after they would be doing an assessment, a physical assessment. They'd want to see the joint. And so I had this conversation, and she said to me, well, that's fine, but I have seen my family doctor three times for this shoulder injury, and he has never made me take my shirt off. So I think we have to appreciate that while it seems totally obvious to us, what I'm hearing from people, members of the public, is that it's not always obvious to them. And I would invite you to go back to that first week of physio school. And there are a few of my classmates in the room today. And I have this like, perfect recollection of our first lab and we were all holding up towels while people carefully took their shirt off and were wearing sports bras and people were very discreet and modest. And by the end of the degree, like the doors to the room were open and nobody cared and every, you know, there was kind of a desensitization that happened. And I think what we forget is that our patients haven't had that same desensitization. They feel like we did on that first day in the lab. 
So the patients don't always realize that they might be asked to disrobe, and they don't necessarily anticipate that very close body-to-body -body contact that might happen as part of our assessment or treatment. So, you know, what do we need to consider that are parts of our usual practice that might be contributing? Well, we often have contact with bare skin on areas of the patient that are normally covered by clothes. So, you know, often we're the, the not very many people laying hands on bare skin that would normally be covered by clothes, and that can feel uncomfortable. Um, our patients are often in gowns or in pajamas if we're treating them, you know, in hospital or at, in their homes, and we often have very close body-to-body -body contact, whether that's for transfers or, um, you know, doing techniques in an outpatient department. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a reality of our practice. So close contact with bare skin. So what's the physio's intention in this? Well, often we're laying our hands on to feel, you know, is there heat? Uh, is there a muscle contracting? Um, what's the quality of the swelling? Um, checking for chest wall expansion, or maybe we're doing manual techniques. But what's the physio, or sorry, what's the patient experiencing in that moment? And in some cases, you know, well, often they're partially undressed. Keep in mind that they're often lying down, so they're sort of below us often facing away from us, and they can't actually see us coming. They can't see that we're about to lay our hands on them. And sometimes the location of touch can be a sensitive issue if it's close to their chest or to their groin. Oh, did I just miss a... Yeah, sorry. Okay, the other thing is how close we get to our patients in a body-to-body -body sort of contact sense. Again, for the physiotherapist, as they're doing their assessment or their treatment, we're in that position and we're often using, we, we don't have enough hands, right? So we put somebody's limb under our arm and we hold it there. Um, we put people's limbs over shoulders. Uh, we rest people's feet at the top of our thigh while we're mobilizing an ankle. Um, we do all these things to try to get an extra set of hands or to support a joint. Um, and so, you know, we have, clinical rationale in our mind for why we're doing that. Um, but from the patient's perspective, how are they feeling? Well, they might feel it's an invasion of their personal space, um, that it's unnecessarily close. Um, so they don't always understand what, that's, what, what the rationale or why we have to be in those positions. So, you know, it, I think we would all acknowledge that touching bare skin and being in close physical contact with our patients is part of physical therapy practice, but it can give rise to misunderstanding. And again, you know, if you see that picture, um, what's the patient experience in that moment about where their foot is and um, it might feel a bit awkward. Uh, so, but you know what, You've, you didn't notice that until I say that, right? Because as physios, we all go, oh, yeah, it's just holding the foot up against their thigh so they can get, you know, stabilize the joint or mobilize or what have you. But it's not necessarily how the patient is perceiving it. So, you know, I don't have any, unfortunately, rocket science things to tell you, um, but I guess what I'd like to, to do is, again, just put that out there as this is sometimes what we're hearing at the college in terms of people calling and, and questions that the public raises. So I just want to raise the awareness on it. Um, and I think the first thing we can do is have clear communication to explain to our patients why we are asking them to disrobe, um, why we are in such close contact with them and ask them, is that okay with you? So we get their consent so that they understand what's going on and, and why our hands are positioned where they're positioned. The other thing I think we might want to think about is the positioning. And if you think about the level of the plinth or the bed, it's very often at groin level for the physiotherapist. And so sometimes what we hear is, you know, the physio had me slide to the edge of the plinth or the edge of the bed, and then they leaned right into me and their groin was pushed right up against me. And so you stop and think about that and you think, well, you know, how does that patient who's lying there, maybe in pain, in a gown, um, with somebody sort of looming over top of them, and then they have this sort of uneasy feeling that um, there's this close body-to-body -body contact. So could we consider, is there a way we could adjust the height of the bed, um, the patient or ourselves, to try to just be aware of what that might feel like from the patient's perspective? The other thing is strategic barriers. So you can see in the picture there, well, it's pretty small, um, they've got even just a towel doubled over um, just to create a sense of distance or space between the physio's hand and the patient's buttocks. Um, in some cases, it might mean that you could put a small rolled towel or a small pillow between your body and your patient's body, again, just to create that physical distance or a sense of distance for the patient. And then the last thing is, I think probably your best bet is to consult with your colleagues because in your own practice context, you've probably come up against scenarios like this and your colleagues probably have some solutions um, based on your 
sort of specific patient population that might be really valuable um, that you could implement easily that wouldn't change the way that your, um, uh, you know, wouldn't, it wouldn't compromise the techniques you're doing, but uh, might make your patients feel more comfortable. So you'd be happy to know that the Patient Relations uh, Committee is actually developing a brochure to help with public awareness um, called What to Expect at Your Physiotherapy Appointment to try to help the public understand what should you expect on your first day and, and what might be part of a normal physiotherapy appointment so that um, we can hopefully provide some education to the public so that they wouldn't be so surprised when some of these things happen. Um, that doesn't take the place, obviously, of our good communication with the patients, but um, that's hopefully um, something that will be available um, for physios to, to use. So if you have any, I think we have a few minutes, and if you have any comments about things that have worked well in your own practice, any suggestions that you'd want to share with the group, I'd love to hear them. They'll help me the next time I get a practice call. Um, so comments are welcome, or if you have any questions. Oh, yes, to please use the microphone. Sure. No, I'm sorry, but this is the live stream for the rest of the province, so we need to hear your questions. Sorry about that. Uh, could you make some co uh, any comments about cultural uh, issues that are associated with that kind of work? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good point. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes there are a few clues to us that the patient might be feeling uncomfortable or that there might be some cultural differences, and those might be scenarios where you want to, um, if it's appropriate, to open the curtain, open the door, um, ask if they want to bring a family member in. Like, there are strategies that you might decide you'd want to implement because sometimes you can kind of see you do kind of pick up from the patient that they might be feeling uneasy or you might perceive that there might be a cultural difference there. Um, I think that you probably implement the same strategies, but I guess pay special attention to nonverbal cues from that, from, some, from somebody that you think might not be um, totally on side or, or, or feeling a bit uneasy about what's going on. Yeah. Thanks. And I was just wondering about percentage of gender, female to male, concerns or public complaints that you receive and also I'm not sure if you're collecting ages or date of birth mm -hmm. and I'm just curious if there's kind of a 10-year range that most of the complaints are coming from. That's a good question and mostly I'm hearing the practice questions as opposed to the complaints and um, you know I don't want to panic people it's not like these are complaints rolling in all the time but I just thought based on what I'm hearing from the public about this um, not necessarily understanding that they would be, you know, bearing skin when they're at a physio assessment or having kind of hands-on contact. I just want to have people take that step back again to try to think about the patient experience. So I don't actually have numbers, and because I'm talking to people on the phone, I don't necessarily know ages or genders. Um, but I, I don't think the genders really matters um, as much as people sometimes this sense that it's not what they were expecting and something about it feels a bit off. And so, can we do something to help make that patient experience better? Yes. Hi, I'm uh, lucky enough to be able to help out in the classrooms up at the uh, University of British Columbia in the physio school there. And one thing that the students are well versed in uh, when they have their interaction with their pretend uh, patient is, hi, I'm so-and-so, yes. we're gonna be doing this, and this might involve me asking you to take your shirt off or touching you, do I have your consent to proceed? And getting that verbal agreement uh, to uh, confirm that the patient understands that mm -hmm. this might be a thing. And I think that's what gets lost when you get out in the real world, there's no time when I, but that getting consent needs to be really uh, practiced. Thank you oh, for making that work. point. I think that's exactly it, is that it's, it, it, you know, when we're starting out to practice, um, we may be a little bit more sensitive to it, and, and it's just like anything else, when we have had exposure over and over, um, we stop, or we're not always, um, as we don't always perceive what it might feel like from the patient perspective, so maybe we can learn something from the students that they are still um, kind of aware and addressing that. I think that's a good idea. Yes. Hi. I'm just wondering if the, the brochure that you're talking about and the language that's used in it will be also applicable to the acute care setting uh, for the patients and families in acute care, because the same concerns come up there. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, and there's a few members of our patient relations committee in the audience, so I appreciate that comment. And it's still in draft format, so I can make a note of that, and we can make sure we go back and look at the language. Um, it's, it, you should know there are several um, public practice physios on that committee, so I, I'm pretty, I feel pretty confident that the language would be transferable, but I'll make sure that we go back and have a look. Thank you. 
Um, I just want to uh, make sure that it also addresses like clients with traumatic brain injury um, who have different ex might have mm. uh, their perception might not be quite the same uh, and uh, sort of vulnerable individuals um, and pedi pediatric Pediatrics. individuals too. It yeah. doesn't quite because we're not necessarily talking about the different populations as much as what can I ask you to, ex to ex Band on that a little bit, what you might want to see in there? Um, it just, just that it needs to be considered. You, you might approach that individual in, in a different way um, as a physiotherapist and how you interact with them. Uh, so you have to consider their age and, and their brain uh, and their understanding okay. of what, what the interaction is. So it's, it's necessary to think about that client. Okay, thank you. All my committee members remember that? Okay. Uh, speaking of language, in what language is, is this uh, proposed brochure going to be printed in or supplied in, and uh, how about uh, for uh, people with visual problems? Mm. Okay, well, it's a good thing I'm mentioning this here because you have lots of good ideas. Um, uh, duly noted, because um, I think at this point the, the thought was to print it in English as we have with our other um, resources, but that makes a very good point, so I will... I can see my committee members taking notes, so thank you. Hi, Susan. Hi, Clary. As, as a senior and seeing the kind of ever our CPA has these beautiful pamphlets and so on, I wonder if it wouldn't be a good idea sometimes to, if you have a senior, it doesn't have to be a senior, but bring somebody with you. Because sometimes two people here, and if there's a language challenge, mm -hmm. or if you have you know First Nation members or any other <coughs> individuals from different parts of world two people will understand it better and not only that it's a golden opportunity to teach that other person who might be a client later on right <laughs> yes thank you clary yes a good point about bringing offering to have somebody else in the room that if they have a family member that they'd like to bring along all right um just do we have time for one quick, okay. really quick? Sure. Um, would it be possible to make sure that this is on the website so we could link it from our clinic websites? Yes. The, so the plan is to put it, it's, it's actually still in the draft phase, so it has to be board approved and so on. But the intent is to um, put it in PDF on the website so people would have access to download it and to send everybody a hard copy. And if people did want to get copies, um, we can look at, you know, we, the, printer, the print layout will be done. So people could have access to that if they wanted to order some. Or we, we'll, we're still kind of in the development stages, but... Real quick, uh, are you going to address it all when the shoe's on the other foot and you're in an acute setting and the patient's constantly exposing themselves? And you just very politely pull down their gown and say, you know, other people are around. But do you have any insights to what you can do in that situation? Yes. Um, uh, you know, do I have any special insight into that? Not really. Um, I work in acute care as well, so I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and I, I think that's, that's just the same, the, just what you are saying is that you acknowledge there are other people around. And I, and I mean, even if there aren't, um, you know, I have had physios call and say, can I demand, like my patient doesn't even want to put a gown on. Or, you know, says they're too hot, they don't, well, yes, you can say, before I treat you, I'm going to have to ask you to put a gown on, or I'm going to have to ask you to to cover up, there are other people in the room. So I think just managing it the way you said is completely reasonable. Yeah. Thanks very much. And if you do have questions, feel free to email or call. And I'm at the college on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Thanks. Oh, don't go away, Susan. <laughs> no, I just wanted to thank Susan on behalf of the group. Uh, and we have a little token of appreciation for you. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> um, I, be, before I hand over the mic to, uh, to Phil to introduce our next speaker, I just wanted to touch a bit on Fred's comment. There, there is an organization in town called the BC Health Regulators, which is the society of the 26 healthcare professionals that have gotten together and, and have formed, have a formal organization. We have a website and a lot, the main focus to begin with was on ensuring that individuals made sure that they contacted regulated health professionals for their care. And the, the website has been translated into, I, I don't know, eight or nine languages. It, it was really set up for individuals coming into the country where English was not their first language. So certainly uh, it is there and it's trans, you know, you can print it off, but it's make sure that the public is aware that they should go to a regulated healthcare professional for their care. I like 
your idea of taking this and I will take it back to that group because we work collaboratively and so instead of just one college paying for something we all pitch in according to our our ability to do so and I think that would be a good second project for them to take on so I'll I'll let you know next year what happens <laughs>